the last paper in the session is called Burst Image Deep Learning Using Permutation Invariant Convolutional Neural Networks by Mika Aitala and Fredo Duran from MIT. And Mika will begin. All right. Thank you for the intro. So this paper is about burst blurring, but the main point is a CNN architecture that treats, uh, treats its inputs in an uh, order-invariant manner. So this, I would argue this is important for many problems where you have sort of scattered data, or scattered evidence among a set of observed images. So burst blurring is one such problem. Uh, to make that more concrete, so in that problem, we have a set of photographs, each suffering from severe uh, camera shake and noise. And um, as you can see, pretty much all of these images are destroyed, but uh, they are destroyed in different ways, so each one still carries complementary cues about what's in the sharp image. And the question is, can we uh, now recover this image computationally? So I'll show a sneak peek of our results to illustrate this. So if we just feed the first image uh, to the network, we get a result like this, which is so and so. There's not much to work with. But when we feed the two of the leftmost images simultaneously, we get this result, which is already much sharper than either one of the inputs. And as we keep, keep feeding the images, uh, the result, uh, uh, more, more detail is resolved, of course, with uh, diminishing returns. Um, and here's the ground truth. So that was synthetic. I'll show real data later. OK, so the key to achieving this, uh, as I said, is a CNN architecture uh, that uh, considers two, two uh, characteristics of this data. So first of all, it doesn't care about how many pictures you feed. You can feed 3, 5, 15. And the more you feed, the better result you're likely to get. But more importantly, and a bit more subtly, uh, you get exactly the same result, regardless of uh, input ordering. And I'll illustrate later why this is important. So in a sense, it uh, treats the inputs as a sort of a bag of images. Uh, we also introduced some tricks uh, in the synthetic data generation, but uh, more on that later. So let's talk about the architecture. And uh, I'll, talk by, uh, I'll begin by discussing RNNs because they sort of illustrate the problems that can arise with sensitivity to input ordering. So we do not use them. Uh, that said, they have been successfully used before by, by Visual and colleagues, for example, last year. But I'll show that we can do better with a different architecture. So the idea there is that we have a recurrent unit, maybe a unit internally. We keep feeding the frames to it. And the network updates the, the, the estimate of the sharp image. And this way, we can feed as many images as we like, of course. Uh, but um, there are some problems with this, like um, the processing experienced by any given input uh, in this unrolled network depends heavily on its position. So it might be that, uh, that uh, the network, for example, forgets what it saw earlier or struggles to incorporate new info as it goes. And in general, it's difficult to sort of uh, combined complementary queues uh, over a long distance. Uh, and I'd argue that all, I mean, all of these basically are related to sensitivity to the input order. So our approach is to design an architecture that's by construction doesn't care about the order. So that should avoid these problems. Uh, the underlying ideas about pooling have previously been discussed by, for example, Zahir and colleagues. Uh, we extend them to like uh, CNN image translation context. Uh, so the most obvious, uh, if you start with this picture, the most obvious uh, source of asymmetry are the directional connections between the, between the uh, units. So let's eliminate them. But now we have just n copies of the network. It's getting a, a single image as an input. So how to combine those into a joint estimate? Uh, so we solve this by treating these initial networks as sort of feature extractors. And they have tied weight, so each image gets uh, the exact same processing by them. After that, we have a pooling layer that collapses this into a joint uh, uh, signal feature map. And finally, there are, uh, and we use max pooling, I'll explain shortly. And finally, there are a few layers that decode these features into the estimate of the image. 
So what's the deal with the max pooling? Uh, the idea is, uh, I mean, max pooling in the sense of getting the maximum activation value across the inputs. So shown with RGB images, you get this, but we use it on the abstract features. So now you have the two, two nice properties there. You have the permutation invariance, because the maximum is just the maximum. Uh, the number of inputs doesn't matter. You can take it over as many features as you like. And the reason why this is supposed to do something is that, well, by end-to-end -end training, the network learns what features, what kind of features will contribute to the end image. And the final layers learn to decode them. So, as said, we can now feed as many or little images as we like, and the order is irrelevant. So internally, we implement these uh, feature extract extractors as units, which is the de facto translation method these days. And these final layers are a couple of convolutional layers. Uh, and we found it useful to also introduce these kind of uh, uh, intermediate pooling layers with, uh, where the features are concatenated back. So that kind of gives it a way, to, uh, way for the feature extractor networks to sort of exchange info before the final crunch. But, uh, but yeah, uh, that's, uh, you can find the details in the paper about that. Uh, so that's it for the architecture. So we train this with uh, synthetic data, which we generate on the fly in TensorFlow from random ImageNet uh, images. Uh, we apply noise, um, uh, heavy blur, and also heavy noise. So the blur kernels are computed as random walks and applied as convolutions. We simulate things like correlated noise common in real-world cameras, and some uh, other defects like the streaky highlights on, in overexposed areas. So from these uh, ImageNet images, we might get bursts like these, for example. Uh, and we randomize the length and difficulty of the burst on a per, per uh, sample basis, so that the network learns to sort of robustly take advantage of whatever cues happen to be present in a given burst. And these are the results uh, the network gets out of these, these particular validations at uh, set bursts. OK, but the real question is, how does this perform with actual data, like real-world data, uh, like actual photos taken with a shaky hand? So let's look at the results. So the, here is an experiment with, uh, with a standard data set for, uh, in bursty blurring. It's a burst of 12 images. I'm just showing a representative one here. So our method gets this result out of it. Uh, and compared uh, to the state-of-the-art uh, neural deep blurring method by Visholek and colleagues from last year, ICCV, I think, uh, they get a result like this. Which, uh, I mean, let's compare it in the zoom. So this is ours. This is theirs. So I would argue that uh, we suffer from much, many fewer like over-sharpening artifacts. And on the other hand, it's easier to read uh, the, the license plate, for example. Uh, but those bursts uh, in that data set, they are kind of easy, because uh, they, they contain some lucky images, for example, like sharp images that the network can then just pick and mostly work on them. So to really challenge these methods, uh, we took a bunch of new bursts with an, with an iPhone with a very shaky hand. So here's one of them. So I'll show you eight images. And I hope you can see from where you are sitting that they are all, all pretty terrible, like heavily shaky hand and, uh, and, and a noisy, noisy image. So let's take a closer look at one region here. So this is the back of a book. And there are actually some numbers in there. Uh, and here is the same crop from all of those uh, eight images. So if you can read the numbers, make a mental note, and you can come for later. They, they should be roughly there. So let's look at the result. Uh, so if we feed just one image to the network, uh, we get uh, this image, which is not that impressive. But as we add a, a second image, it gets sharper. But see what happens with three, four, five, six, seven, and eight images. So here is the result for the full uh, full burst. And I want to stress there's nothing sequential about the method. I just showed you eight different results here to illustrate how the method behaves. 
So let's look uh, again at the back of the book. And uh, if you can, I don't know if you can read the numbers this time. So uh, and, uh, I'll just flip back and forth with a typical input photo. And I hope you agree that yeah, it's much more legible now. And here's the same, same uh, crop shown as a function of the number of input images. And we actually went and verified that these are the numbers present in the physical sample too. So it's not just uh, hallucinating them. And in this data set, we really couldn't get any of the previous methods to produce a, a particularly good result, like uh, where, you, where you could actually read the numbers. Uh, so numerical ex uh, uh, one numerical experiment we made was uh, studying how the reco reconstruction quality depends on the number of inputs. So for example, this first bar here shows that when you have a single image and you add a second image to that first, you're likely to experience a large increase in the SSIM of the reconstruction. Of course, the particular of this curve depends very heavily on the data set. This was on our uh, synthetic data. Okay, so the biggest limitation is that it assumes a static scene. The only thing moving is the hand. Uh, but we do have some, some initial experiments in the, in the paper with the flow aligned data that they used in, for example, the DVD, the video deblurring paper. And uh, it's basically compatible with that. So possibly another fundamental limitation. The runtime, not quite cell phone yet, but maybe a few years. Um, uh, and as a higher level point, I'd just like to point out the similarity to like classical inference approaches where you had like a bunch of images of something and you wanted to make some joint inference out of them and you would use maybe, uh, you would maybe do that by adding together like um, log likelihood functions and then trying to find a maximum. And um, I see these uh, pooling schemes as sort of a sort of a black box version of that. And that's kind of difficult to do with vanilla CNNs. So I hope that uh, this kind of uh, approaches will catch on. And I think they are, they are very promising for, for many problems. And then uh, while the biggest advantage comes from the architecture, it also benefits uh, quite significantly from the very ambitious training data. We use quite extreme blurs and noises. Um, and especially, I, I would say that uh, in deep blurring, it's, uh, it's beneficial to consider the uh, denoising simultaneously. Because in realistic situations, like, like these iPhone photos I showed, you're going to get lots of blur and lots of noise too, especially in low light. Okay, so the code data and this new data set, uh, pre trained model, all that, are coming up, I promise. Uh, and come see us at the poster 29. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Time for a few questions. I'll start with one. Um, so I'm assuming you, uh, I think you're assuming that the images are aligned roughly? Yeah, yeah, we but align them initially using homographies. Mm -hmm. so. uh, presumably that's because when you're doing max pooling, you want the features that are being kind of pooled to be, I mean, how sensitive yeah. is it to that alignment? If that alignment yeah. is off, how well does it work? Yeah, it's not super sensitive. Like uh, you can clearly see like a bit of parallax and a bit of shake between them, so they are to a couple of pixels, to a few pixels, and it seems, it seems to tolerate it. But yeah, I, I do think it, uh, it's beneficial to align them instead of having the network learn that, because, I see. because this like the image to image mapping, it's sort of an orthogonal question to have it learn like long, long distance transport. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, qu question here. Right. The um, so the results you showed, so it's uh, on your left, here. Okay. Well, here. Somewhere. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, your results depend on having approximated um, or having estimated correctly the shakiness of your camera in your training set. So you have a distribution of noise uh, and shake statistics in the training set. 
and I assume that the performance in the test set will be uh, better if the test set matches the training set. So I would have expected that you would have had an experiment of how well does the method work when the two are mismatched, and you know, how far can you go? Uh, so wait a minute. So we do have like a, yeah, we train on synthetic with non ground truth, and right. then we have a validation set that has different images, but sure, the same distribution of, uh, of blurs, that's true. Is this the question? Like, uh, that's right, that's right. So if yeah. my hand shakes more than yours, right. you have trained on a certain oh, training yeah. set, <laughs> Would I expect yeah. that the results are the same for my hand and yours? Yeah, it's a good question. We could have uh, looked at that with synthetic data. Good point. But, uh, but I guess the, guess the generalization to the real world case does show something, something to that effect. But uh, yeah, that would be a good study. Uh, May we, I ask you one more question? Oh. Maybe we'll, we'll go ahead. Oh. So kind of related to that question, I was thinking that you probably have correlation between the frames, right? The, the blur if your hand is moving. So do you think that there would be kind of a lot of benefit to, to doing something which actually takes into account kind of the order? Yeah, I mean, that is a good point, And it's a slightly subtle issue. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's true that there are minor serial correlations there. So the argument that is perfectly permutation invariant is uh, approximate, but I think that uh, having a, a method that would actually take, be able to take those into account would be something like an RNN, which then you pay, pay a big price for that in terms of it being difficult to train and empirically it doesn't work quite as well as these methods. Uh, but yeah, there would be a minor, minor correlation. I think it's very minor because Basically, it means that one kernel, if it does this, then on the next frame, it might start with a similar, similar direction. But I don't know how useful that, that info is in practice. Okay, we'll take one last question. Uh, mm, mm, I have like a one, two comments on, on the, like a, uh, deep sets is not ICLR 2017, it's the 2000, uh, uh, NIPS 2017, just. Oh, sorry, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, also I have one question because the permutation invariant in putting permutation, uh, actually this data is uh, sort of tried with the uh, different method like a point net uh, is the, the one it's exactly used the same idea as deep set. Right. Uh, but it's not limited to max pooling. You can try different type of the symmetric function like a uh, average pooling, yep. even some other things like a median, uh, every uh, sort of this function is a permutation invariant. Have you tried like uh, something else rather than max pooling to, to see how it's the result? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question too. Yes, we have tried. We did try average pooling. Uh, it works roughly the same. Conceptually, I liked uh, maybe the max pooling in the sense that maybe with, uh, arguably with it, if you have like a couple of good frames and lots of bad frames, the bad frames wouldn't dilute the good ones. But uh, admittedly, we don't have uh, much experiments to support this. But essentially, the performance was the same with that. But yeah, uh, median pooling would be interesting. It's uh, tricky in TensorFlow, I think. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's thank Mika and all the other speakers in the session. And